Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, welcome to the Israeli Pavilion. Israel Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development is pleased to welcome you to the event on agriculture and water, maximizing every drop, the Israeli experience. Looking at the current climate reality and global scarcity of water for agriculture, we believe that responsible management and reuse technologies are a tool for establishing a sustainable agriculture and resilient food systems. In today's event, we will share the various aspects of Israel's agriculture, water management and practices. I would like to invite Daniel Werner, head of the Foreign Relations and International Cooperation, Israel's Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development for opening words and sharing the ministry's platforms supporting the continuous, responsible, and efficient advances <coughs> in water management for agriculture. Daniel, please. Hi. Hi to everyone. Water is the most important natural resources, or is one of the most important natural resources. Many regions of the world are experiencing growing water deficit as a result of increasing demand by driven, driven population, driven, demand driven by population growth, climate change, and global warming. It's a time that we consider and manage the water resource as a bank account. If we do not deposit as much as we spend, our account will go into deficit. Let's assume that there is a temporary drought. This is a phenomenon that, that will ca cause a temporary water deficit. Will a temporary phenomenon definitively affect the agricultural production? It will probably have a negative economic influence, but it will not cause the collapse of the production system in the long term. What happens when the problem of a drought, it's not temporary, but becomes permanent. The problem we face today, it's not temporary, and has become a permanent problem that requires basic, basic and structural solution. This is the situation that Israel has been facing from its early years. In Israel, Ensuring sufficient reserve of water is a, is a strategic issue. And the case of water manage management in Israel is a good example that can serve as a study case. A large part of Israel is located on the edge of the desert, and most of this area is arid and semi-arid. The scarcity of water has generated intense efforts to maximize use of the available supply and to seek for new resources. We, at the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, have established structural solution that, in the course of the time, has allowed us to transform a major disadvantage in a comparative advantage. Based on the establishment of an ecosystem that incorporates both policy and multi-sectoral platforms, we have ensured the flow of information among the relevant stakeholders that are involved in applied research, 
technology development, and the assimilation of practices and regula regulation. The Ministry of Agriculture, together with the regulatory agencies, R&D institutions, rural extension services, and the private sector generate solutions with environmental and economic sustainability. This is the ecosystem that brought us solution based on the efficient use of the resource with technology, technologies such as a drip irrigation that reduce the impact of the drought and climate change on food, on food produce, production. Use of treated waste water in agriculture and the salinization plant that, that ensure a strategic solution for the supply of most of part of the drinking water for the population and additionally for farmers. In Israel, water is a national commodity and is under the government's responsibility to manage and reserve. Our mission at the Ministry of Agriculture is to ensure food security for our people. In order to achieve this, we must establish a resilient food production system, and for this we need land and water. We must, at a reasonable price, enable our farmers to produce food in quantity and in quality for the entire population. This event will share with you how it's managed, developed, and foreseen in Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, for your introduction. It is clear that the Ministry of Agriculture plays a significant role in Israel's agricultural water system, ecosystem. Water is needed to grow crops and to produce food. The ability to regulate the crop-plant water balance is among the most critical factors determining plant productivity and its survival. And it serves as a tool for the precise use of water in crop management and of agricultural production in drought conditions. I am honored to invite Professor Menachem Moshelion to deliver his talk on the functional screening for drought-tolerant crops. Uh, Menachem is a researcher at the Institute. No, please, Menachem. He's a researcher at the Institute for Plant Sciences and Genetics, Faculty of Agriculture, Food and Environment, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Menachem, please. Thank you, Daniel Galit, for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. Shalom. So, um, my name is Menachem Oshelion. I'm a plant physiologist at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the Faculty of Agriculture. And I want to start with a short introduction. You know, plants, in particular crops, are responsible to all the food we eat, to all the fiber we use, and basically also to all the oil we use. All started with a very ancient uh, procedure called photosynthesis, where light, water, and CO2 are used to produce sugars, only sugars. This is what photosynthesis does. Later, these sugars are translated to be metabolites, which is proteins, RNA, DNA. Basically, this is our food. And crop responds to all of it. Crops are autotrophic plants. I mean, plants are autotrophic, which means they use the water and mineral from the soil, sun, to produce us basically all the minerals and, and nutrients we need. And in this process, plants lose a lot of water to the atmosphere in order to gain CO2. This is a very principal mechanism called water use efficiency, but the numbers are immense. In order to produce, to get one CO2 molecule from the air, one, plants need 500 molecules of water. This is under normal condition. So if you do the calculation for one maize, or one banana, the farmer needs to irrigate 100 liters of water. These numbers are incredible. And this is why we need to work so hard to find better water use plants. One kilo of avocado, one kilo, it's like three to four avocado, need to be irrigated in 500 liters of water. Israel is a major export of avocado. So we need a lot of water for agriculture. And the problem is, we all know, this is why we are here, global changes. This graph here in orange show you, okay, this orange part, 
are the yield losses in one droughted year. One year, you lose between 60 to 80% of your yield. Now, what is drought is a big question, but it's enough not to have rain for three weeks in places that doesn't irrigate, and you have total loss of, of your, of your uh, fields. These are the all major crops in the world. So, of course, the FAO defined that we need to increase food production in 2050 by 50 to 70 percent. This is a nice thing. The problem is the water. Now, that means that today, if we are here, we have to be here at 2050. Basically, for scientists, that means you need to improve the, the breeding. Breeding process, as you see in the graph, is very successful in the last year. What you see in the graph, these are the years. And this is the amount of food we can produce. These are cereals. You see, more than double, almost three times, we improve the food production of cereals. These are legumes. Legumes are protein plants, like chickpea, like soya, like peas. Legumes mainly made us sugars, carbohydrates. And sorry, uh, cereals make us carbohydrates, and, and uh, legumes make us the protein. This is the major protein source from plants. The problem that to breed this plant to be tolerant to drought, you need between 20 to 25 years just for one crop. It's a long process. I'm not going to get to detail why, but it's a very long process. And in the end, we have to find alternative approaches. And I want to, to, today to suggest a bit of a different approach. This global map shows you the, the lens we use today for agriculture. OK, it looks like round, but this, the percentage are real. We use 70% to, to percent of the lands to produce food based on plants, plants only. 13% more, these are plant-based food used to feed animals, chickens, uh, and so on. And about 70% of our lands are used to produce meat and milk and other factors uh, in pasture. If to take out of this part, all the meat and milk, you get about 50%, more 70% of the land today used only for meat. Just meat. Okay? Now, I think that if you can take a small percentage of this part to produce protein plants, this could save us a lot of time in this 2050 production. Remember, we need to make 50 to 70% more food. I suggest to, to prepare more protein food. What do I mean by that? To make 100 gram of protein, okay, protein that we eat, if you base it on animals, you need 185 square meters to grow 100 grams of proteins, right? Most of the meat we eat is for proteins. To the same amount of protein, 100 grams, you need only 3.5 meters of chickpea, for example, or peas. 50 times less area to produce the same amount of protein. So, in my research, together with Professor Shahal Abu, there in the pictures, we collect, he collected and he gave me uh, chickpeas from all over the world. And why we choose chickpea for protein? Many good reasons, but one important one is the fact that chickpea is growing in arid lands. Okay, chickpea can grow in places that from the beginning doesn't have so much water. So, in my lab, what we do, we took all these 110 chickpeas and we look for a way to screen them, to look for the best way to find the plants that will be most tolerant to drought. How do you do it? You can look at the plant, right? You can just use imaging. But then if you expose them to drought, you can have the top plant or the bottom one. Which one would you, you choose for breeding? The upper one? Wrong. The upper one looks good just because it closes stomata and keeps its water. That means it does not produce. It's like looking for a worker in the field and choosing the one with the clean hands in the end of the day. It doesn't, doesn't really do the work, right? You want the one with the dirty hand that looks very poor. This is why imaging is so confusing. And we have to use different approach. Our approach is based on physiological screening. We don't look at a plant. We measure its activity and performance, we use it like, you know, the Apple Watch that measures your physiological all over the day. So if you are running on a runner and somebody measures your threat, 
your physiological traits, you can, we can really very fast do a physiological profile under stress and non-stress. This is called stress test. We do the same only for plants. We use the plant ITEC system, a system that we have in the faculty. It's an it's a tech company developed in Israel and now selling all over the world. This technology enables us to control each plant, soil, water, and atmosphere conditions. So we measure each plant in a randomized design. We can follow its soil water content, growth rate, transpiration, and all the plants are exposed to similar conditions. So we can do a continuous and simultaneous exam. It's very important because you want to compare your plants exposed to the exact same conditions. So the system enables us to do any drought we want per each plant in the array. Each one can get a different treatment, so we can really compare the best under certain treatment. And we get many physiological results out of the system, so we can actually screen the plant that are more suitable to the areas we really want to breed in. Of course, it's going to be arid places. This is a picture from my greenhouse. I have more than 500 units like this. That means I can screen simultaneously 500 plants. And we, f we follow for many traits. I just show you a short example. I'm not going to get to the scientific part. But we look for plants that can grow very fast. Then when they are exposed to drought, they will close the matter also very fast and recover from drought very fast. So they need to well grow under welling condition. But this is a drought point. When you recover it, you also want to have the plants to have a very nice dry shoot <coughs> and very good water use efficiency. I explained before what is water use efficiency. is the amount of water per amount of carbon the plant uses. Also very important, as I, as I said before, we want to test the recovery rate. This is drought. You can see the soil water content don't come down. Here is the, when the plant recovers, let's say rain comes, you want the plants that recover the fastest. Like in one day, keep production like they previously did. So what we did, we took all the 100 population of chickpea, we screened them in this test together, and we look for this plant that really has all these parameters. I'm not going to get too much details in these 15 minutes. But the idea is to look for the best candidate that could be selected based on their performance and only then uh, breed them together with high protein and so on. So the idea is really to have a physiological screening to find the best plant to the best scenario and continue with the breeding later on for other important traits like high protein, uh, early flower, um, vitamin minerals, and so on and so forth. So, in conclusion, what I think, what I suggest, that this plant, sorry, that this plant we select may be used in this small part, maybe 10% of the zone we use today for meat. Remember, we need 50 times less area to produce the same amount of protein. So I just want to thank uh, the, the Ministry of Agriculture the Ministry of Innovation and DFP and also the ISF, ISF, the Israeli Scientific Foundation, for funding me uh, uh, most of my research, and thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, please. This might not be a question for you, but we need an alternative for me. So what is the future of lab-grown or cultured meat to replace the meat that we wouldn't grow to create chickpea protein. So I'm a plant physiologist, and I can tell you, you can get very cheap, very rich proteins which are not meat. Neutral, from a neutral point of view, it's perfect. Now, if you really want to taste meat and to have a meat growing in the lab, you have to ask somebody, someone else. I truly believe that the plant-based meat is much more important, but it's me. I don't want to fight with anyone else here. Yes, please. What is the role of genetic screening or phylogenetics in speeding up the process for identifying it, high yield plants? It's part of the role. Color? So today you can get a genome very, very cheap, very quickly, like $1,000. The problem, you have the gene list, but you don't have the performance, right? So 
you have like 30,000 genes, but you don't even know how it's going to respond to drought. So you have to have the functional screening. It's not going to help you unless you can really connect these two methods. So genome are very important, but you have to see how the plant looks, I would say, but more important, performs. Last question. Okay. Perennial cereals, like what? No, I'm asking. In the Most of the cereals I know are seasonal. <coughs> perennial plants, yes, from cacao trees to to to, uh, to uh, coffee trees. But perennials are much. The, the question is very different because in annual plants, when you lose the season, you lose the season. In perennial, you can lose one season. Maybe next season, if the plant doesn't die, you're still going to get it. If annual plant just survive, it doesn't help you because you have to have the yield. So with annuals, it's not a survival question, it's production questions. It's very different. Okay, thank you very much. Pleasure. Menachem, thank you very much for your excellent uh, lecture. Uh, and have a safe flight. Menachem has a flight like now, so he's leaving. As mentioned in Daniel's talk, integrated water resources management is based on the understanding that water resource is an in integral component of the ecosystem, a natural resource, and a social and economic good, and should be managed with great care and responsibility, in particular in cases of scarcity. I would like to invite Danny Greenwald, Senior Deputy Director General for Regulation of the Israel Water Authority, to share with us the Israeli scenario and experience and to deliver his lecture on facing water challenges in scarce areas, water and agriculture. Okay, so I'm Danny Greenwald. I'm from the Israeli Water Authority. The Israeli Water Authority is the regulator of the Israeli water sector, which means I'm a regulator. I'll be telling you everything about how regulation is lovely. And yes, we also need scientists and research and otherwise. I must say, I learned in the faculty where he teaches. I don't remember having professors so interesting. So, let's start. Who here was never in Israel? Everyone who was never in Israel, Israel, Palestine? Everyone were here in Israel? No, okay. A few people weren't, so I will start the presentation and, uh, 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 on a... One moment, figure out how it works. Okay, we're talking about how do we face... Uh, uh, face uh, agriculture in a scarce area like in Israel. Where is Israel? Well, we're in Egypt, we're in Sharm el-Sheikh, right over here. Israel is a little bit to our north, along the Mediterranean Sea. You can see uh, neighboring Egypt, where we are now, um, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Palestinian Authority. One of the things that one of our challenges in Israel is our population. Our population is growing rapidly. We have a very high birth rate and we have a lot of immigration, and you can see that our population has grown almost five times since the 1960s, and it is continuing to grow. We are still growing, which means we always have a challenge of how do we supply more water. The other two challenges we have is the pattern of our climate. We have rain four or five months in the year, when the rest of the year we do not have rain, okay? And the rain we have is scattered. We have much more rain in the north and very little rain, practically none, in the south. So we have here three challenges. The first challenge is how do we use the water for all our population, which is scattered, when most of our water is in the north? Well, that we solved in the 1950s and 1960s with a conveying system, which transfers water from where we have it naturally to where we need it. Our second challenge is, how do we deal in the summer when we have no rain? How do we supply water? Um, our system is built on groundwater and on surface water on the Sea of Galilee. So we are able to run the gap and we can manage with half a year, seven months, eight months, nine months without any rain and we can supply water. But the biggest problem we have is how do we have enough water to supply to our population? Because our population is growing and we're in a semi-arid area, area and the amount of rain that we can count on as renewable water sources today is about half of the water that the Israeli population is using. So I have a built-in system with a shortage of water. How do I deal with that? Well, 
let's start with our playground, playground and see what, do we, what is water used for in Israel. And by that, we'll see how do we deal with the shortage. This is a data from last year. Half of our water is used for agriculture, mainly in the summer, because in the winter it rains, so mainly in the summer. So half of our water is supplying during a few months. Domestic and industry use water all the year around. We have a little bit to nature. Nature is places where the uh, levels of the aquifer have gone down and uh, um, springs no longer spring. And we're supplying water artificially until we manage to raise the levels of the aquifer and have the ecosystem go back to its natural situation. And we have about 7% that we are supplying to our neighbors. Uh, our neighbors is the Palestinian Authority and the Kingdom of Jordan. And the kingdom, at least the Kingdom of Jordan is expected to grow uh, uh, quite a lot in the next few years due to new agreements that are, uh, were made. So those are, our play, th those are who we're dealing with in our playground. Th those are our consumers. And let's see how we can deal, make sure that we have enough water. Well, let's start with regulation. Regulation that encourages effective use of the water. <laughs> How can, I how can I encourage my population to use water effectively? Well, let's we'll start with all the water in Israel is being metered. You measure how much everyone uses. It doesn't matter if it's a farmer, or if it's a household, or if it's a church, or a synagogue, or a kindergarten, or a school. Every, all, the all the water is mattered on a user's basis, meaning it's not the building, it's not the neighborhood, it's my apartment. Danny Greenwald's apartment will have a water meter. Everyone pay for their water, and they pay depending on how much water they use. So you have an incentive to use less water, because it's important to save water, but also because it's important to save money, and it works. And again, every school, every prayer house, every garden, okay. Um, we've done measurement, we've done tariffs. If we still don't have enough, then we use quotas. We use quotas and determine how much water can each sector use because we know we don't have enough. Or there were times that we knew we didn't ha have enough. Once you've done those three things, the sector has uh, in t in, in, in a reason to try to chase, use water more efficiently and, and uh, incentive to, to do things, okay? Well, later on, here we, we'll hear a lecture on uh, NDROP, on the irrigation system. You will have an irrigation system you will have all the irrigation system in Israel are pressurized. Not because that's the law, but because we put in conditions that you want to use your water as efficient as possibly, and you'll do it in pressurized systems, and in more and more systems that will be, uh, 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 more and more systems that will be more efficient. Um, Non-revenue water, leakage of water. I've been here, heard about pe people where, uh, uh, countries where 20, 30, 40% of the water leaks out of the pipes. But if it's measured and you're paying, then you'll have intensive to use it more efficiently. So, one moment. So, we have supply system. As I say, we transfer water from area to area. We, uh, um, we have a, um, a system where we use all the different water sources. Uh, um, this system will have the Sea of Galilee with the surface water, a mountain aquifer, a shore aquifer, and it's all blended into the same system and managed. And I will also have regional water systems, mainly when I use them for treated wastewater. Okay, so I transferred water, I used groundwater, I convinced the population to use water efficiently, a lot of education, a lot of financing, I'm still running out of water, what can I do? Well, one is the side that the population will manage without water, okay? Half of our water used for agriculture, we don't have water, we won't have agriculture. There are places in the world that do that. We did not like the solution. We developed alternative water sources or new water sources. It started with treated wastewater, okay? Half of our water is used in the towns. This water leaves the towns. We started with treated wastewater. And when the need came even bigger in the last 15 years, we're using a lot of sea desalination. And if you look at the water consumption for agriculture, you can see that we've gone from almost all of the water, high quality potable water, down to 30%. And this was in 1917. It's gone even lower by using alternative water sources. So, what are the advantages in using treated wastewater? Why is it worth our while? 
we will also talk about the dangers. First of all, we're transferring a, a, an obstacle into a resource, okay? If we don't use the treated wastewater, what do we do with it? We apply it to our streams, we apply it to the sea, we want to use it in a better way. Um, we'll have another, we can give, uh, we can have another fresh water resource. In our case, where the water is used for agriculture, every farmer that started using treated wastewater, he had to give up his high quality water, his potable water, and we could transfer it to use in the cities. Now, this is possible because of the Israeli water law, and I'm a regulator, where the water is owned by the people and run by the government. So we had the ability, we had the ability to take the water quotas from the farmers, give it to the municipalities, but still find a different water source for the farmers. Now, when I'm talking about a reclaimed water system, what are we talking about? And I'm talking here about agriculture. What will it look like? I want you to visualize it, okay? So we have a treatment plant. It's this little, little thing over here. Of course, if you want to tr use treated wastewater, it has to be collected, it has to be treated, so it will be at the right quality. We will have seasonal reservoirs. Wastewater is produced all around the year. We use it for agriculture in the dry season. This means we have four, five, six months where uh, we're producing treated wastewater, but we're not irrigating. We want this water, so we build large reservoirs, so we use them during the summer. We'll have a pumping station, and we'll have the end users. All the farming here, except this, this is a fish pond. We do not use it for fish ponds. All the agriculture you see here, it's all irrigated with treated wastewater. In this case, it's treated at a very high level and can be used for all crops, including eating crops. Most of what is grown here is bananas and avocado, but also eating crops will be used with this water. Now, we do not treat our water to the quality of drinking water. We are not California, which are trying to do tea to tea, which is toilet to tap. For drinking water, we have other sources. We don't need the treated wastewater, so we don't have to get it to the very, very high level for drinking. We can use it at a lower level, and our tea to tea is toilet to tomato, okay? So then you have a lower quality, much cheaper to take care of the water. You need much less technology to take care of the water, but it comes at a price. The price is a, a, a separate supply system. I will have a separate supply system for the treated wastewater, and I will run it regionally, because um, I don't need it nationally. One moment, how much time do I have left? I okay? I will do it re regionally. So, most of the wastewater in Israel tr is used in direct systems. You take it from the wastewater a uh, 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 treatment plant, put it into a reservoir, and from the reservoir it will go to the fields. Last few years it's been very popular to use also energy, PV energy, on the reservoirs. But we have also one big system called the Shafdan, takes the greater area of Tel Aviv, and it is a non-direct use, which means it's treated, infiltrated into the aquifer, and half a year later pumped out and transferred for use. What is our system today? What were our mistakes? And what can you learn from it? And it's good to learn from other people's mistakes. I usually don't do it, but it's, it's smart. Um, we start from the end. What do we want to use the water for? Agriculture. What quality do we need for using for agriculture? Well, we need the plants to like it. And we had a plant professor here talking about, uh, talking about what plants need to grow. And we need it to be safe for the environment and safe for the public health. So once we decided what quality do we want for the end product, <coughs> how do we get there? And we get there by going backwards, okay? We know what we want here. Let's go to the wastewater treatment plant and see what can it take care of. Well, all the great wastewater treatment plants in Israel are biological. They all take care of organic matters and nutrients. We do not have desalination. Desalination is expensive. Desalination gives you questions, what do you do with the prime? How do you dispose it? So, I know my end product. I know that this can take care of the organic matters. I know that the city will add various things. It will add salt, it will add fat, it will add organic matter. The organic matter I can take care of, the salt I can. And this will bring me to the water that I put into the system. And in our case, if we're talking about plants, and plants don't like salinity. With high salinity, the plants 
die. They really don't like it, okay? So if I want to have an end product that I can use, then I need to start with very low levels of salinity. So after I add it into the municipality and the wastewater treatment plant, I will be able to use it. This means that I need an integrated system, which I'm holding the whole system and making sure that I use it properly. Okay? Now, uh, 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 examples for things that will bother us for in the sewage. If I have phenols or detergents or, 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 or detergents, then I will have a problem running my wastewater treatment plant. It won't work, work well. If I have oil and grease, the pipes will clog up. It won't even arrive to the wastewater treatment plant. If I have sulfate and pH and I'm emit a steel pipe, I won't have a pipe, okay? Uh, um, if I have high salinity, what will happen with the plants? The plants won't like it. If the plants won't like it, the farmers won't like it. If the farmers won't like it, they won't take it. I don't have a product anymore, okay? And the last thing is the heavy metals. The heavy metals in activated sludge, you won't see them in the water, but you'll see them in the sludge. And all the sludge, or almost all the sludge in Israel, goes through compostation and reuse for agriculture. So I have to reduce the heavy metals in the source, so I will not, so I will be able to use this, the, 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 use it safely. So we're back to regulation. We have regulation on what you're allowed to supply as water to the system. You have regulation on what you're allowed to add as to the wastewater. And we have regulation on the end product. And the end product, you will have parameters that are interest the plant and the soil, and you will have parameters that will interest the, the water source if you have an aquifer and uh, uh, um, public health. At the end, money helps. And if we want the farmers to use treated wastewater, then they have to have motivation. So one motivation is, well, we have plenty of treated wastewater, we have very little potable water, what do you choose? But we want to go another stage, and the, the other stage is pricing. The government subsidizes infrastructure in such a way that the treated wastewater will be much cheaper than other water sources. And then the farmers will ask to use this water. Not in the first day, but as, as time goes and they see the advantages, they will want to use it. Bottom line, if I take the 15 years since 98 and almost 20 years in 2016, we went down in using potable high quality water. Oh, well, it's missing here. We should have another one down here. This is the high quality water. We went down from 77% to 35. And three years ago, we already went down to 30%. <coughs> and we've transferred the Israeli system to other water sources treated wastewater and desalinated and they and they they feed one each other i will have very low salinity treated wastewater treated uh, um, desal which will go into the system and bring me high quality treated wastewater now i gave here i think a lovely presentation but is this the way it really worked in israel well not really okay when Treated wastewater started being used largely in the 1960s. They took whatever they had and used it for whatever they could. So the quality was low, the salinity was high, they couldn't really use it on, uh, on eating, thing, eating crops, and they used it for crops that could deal with a high salinity and, and give you some kind of value, the value, like cotton. In the long term, it damaged the plants, it damaged the soil. Since then, we've done a lot of research. You heard the professor right now. We've done a lot of research. This research is necessary so you can run the system sustainably, sustainably. And I think by today, we have managed that. And when we have the high quality treated wastewater, uh, uh, um, we can use it in a safe manner. Questions? Yes, sir, if I understand you correctly, you don't uh, irrigate with desalinated water directly. You uh, use desalinated water for drinking, and then that, that good quality treated wastewater goes to irrigation. And will we soon be at a stage where desalinated water can be cheap enough for irrigation, do you think? 
Okay, first of all, I won't say that we don't use desalinated water for irrigation. <coughs> we do in some cases, but we prefer, we prefer not to use it directly, uh, um, but to have it through the municipalities. What will happen when the desalination will be cheaper than the treated wastewater? That's a very good question, um, um, and I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. But I don't know if that will really ever happen, because um, you have to treat the wastewater in any case, okay? at least by the Israeli regulation. And by the way, treating the wastewater to dispose to the sea or to a river in Israel is more expensive than treating it for agriculture. Because for treating it for agriculture, you can leave the, the, the nutrients, because the plants like the nutrients, not very high levels, but at, at a certain level. And if you're sending it to the, to the sea, then the sea is very sensitive to nutrients. So you, in any case, have the cost. The question is, uh, um, once you've treated it, the additional cost to use it for, for, for agriculture or for otherwise. But I actually think the difference will be, uh, the, will have a different difference. Um, in the world, more and more, there's use of treated wastewater as potable water, water for drinking, mainly in places where they can't do the switch that we had from taking water for agriculture or desalinating for, from the sea because they don't have a sea nearby. Um, as those technologies get more, uh, have more experience and maybe the prices will get lower, we might decide to treat all the treated wastewater and put it into the same system and then instead of having today a dual system, one for high quality water and for low quality water, we'll have one system. But right now the Israeli Health Ministry, who here is from the Israeli Health Ministry? Okay, the Israeli Health Ministry are not willing to hear about the concept of drinking it. So we'll let the Americans and Singapore's uh, take care of it and maybe in 15 years we'll deal with it. overcome people's perception of uh, using recycled water for food and for drinking one day. Can we overcome that uh, or not? How do we overcome? Well, that's a good question. In Israel, we don't really have a problem. I mean, most Israelis are very proud about Israel using treated wastewater. Oh, yes, we're the best in the world. Um, um, but now and then you hear people saying, but of course we use it only for cattle feed. And I say, no, we use it for eating. They say, impossible, can't be. Well, we do it and people eat it and people are happy. Um, so it's not, really, it's not really an issue. I don't know why. It's not really an issue. Are there any incentives put in place to improve uh, water use efficiency? Oh, yes, of course. Like subsidies for, for drip and stuff like that? It starts, much early, it starts it's much more basic in our case. If all the water is, is metered and all the water you pay for, then you have an intent to, uh, initiative to, 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 to use it more efficiently. If you have a quad of water and you can use it for one acre in one irrigation method or for 10 acres using a different irrigation method, what will you pick? Okay? Uh, 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 now, in some cases, every time we raise price, prices then for the water for farming, then uh, uh, um, sometimes the, there are some subsidizing for re renewing the systems and having them more efficient. But that, it exists, but that isn't the real, it isn't real matter. You, just, you build your market where it's worthwhile, and it happens on its own. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm from Washington State, and where we have the private sector owns water rights, so they'll own a certain uh, amount of water. Are you saying it doesn't work that way in Israel? Definitely not. Definitely not. We had last uh, two weeks ago in Israel there was a uh, a, a big delegation of re reuse water. Um, 42 Americans, starting from the EPA, I think there was also Washington, Washington Water, uh, um, various sectors, and they're kind of looking at how do we use our system. Our system is totally different. We do not have water rights. By the water law, the water is owned by the people, run by the government. No water rights. Now, as the government, we have responsibility that all sectors will flourish and, and develop. Okay, so I won't go to the farmers and say, okay, I took your water, bye, you have a problem. No, we'll find a solution but we're very, very different from the American system. Thank you.
Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Danny, thank you very much for your excellent and very informative lecture. Water is a scarce resource and the, the reuse of which is a tool. You're here already. Okay. Of which is a tool for establishing sustainable agriculture in the current climate reality. I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Clive Lipshin. Uh, Dr. Clive is the director of the Center for Transboundary Water Management at the Arava Institute for Environmental Studies. Clive oversees research and development projects, workshops and conferences focusing on transboundary water and environmental problems faced in Israel and the region. Clive, please. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here at uh, COP27. Um, so uh, I'm very pleased that uh, I'm speaking after uh, the government, after the acad academic and the government regulator. Um, what I want to talk about is um, how do you provide a wastewater treatment to communities and to facilities that are producing wastewater that lack access to infrastructure. So what we heard uh, previously, Israel as a country is super efficient in providing uh, the infrastructure needs, the regulatory needs to get uh, wastewater um, as a valued uh, resource to farmers. Um, we've taken a lot of that research and a lot of that knowledge through the work that we've done uh, throughout the years at the Arava Institute and we asked ourselves this question, how do you provide that kind of a service to communities that lack access to sewer grids? How do you provide that kind of a service to communities that lack effective governance structures or finance mechanisms or regulatory structures? So um, what I'm going to talk to you today um, is an example of uh, the first commercial venture that has been launched uh, from uh, more than 20 years of research conducted at the Arava Institute um, where we said maybe here is one way to think about providing that kind of service and those kinds of opportunities to farmers uh, in areas of the world where access to an infrastructure, effective governance, financing, and so on, uh, is a challenge. Whoop, other way. Okay, so uh, we launched a company uh, called Laguna Innovation, uh, and I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, describing uh, the company uh, and how we feel that we can provide a solution uh, to getting this water to communities that we would, or, or users, that we would term or define as off-the-grid or decentralized uh, approaches to uh, wastewater treatment and reuse in agriculture. So this is just uh, walking you through uh, uh, the, the, the uh, sort of the, the, the basic advantages of our, of our company and our approach. One thing uh, when you work at a community level is uh, how do you scale up? It's one thing to provide service to a household or to one uh, group of uh, households, but the challenge is how do you go from, let's say, one area of a village to the entire village to a whole sector of villages or communities. So the issue of modularity and scalability is very important uh, when you're thinking about how to address these issues. Second, of course, uh, when you are working uh, at these uh, 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 community levels where uh, there is uh, oftentimes low levels of capacity, you have to think about uh, the operational and management uh, issues. It's not just, to, not just good enough to say, I have been able to raise the money for the capital expense for installing or instituting certain technologies, but probably one of the greatest challenges, especially in the developing world and for sustainability, is long-term operation and maintenance. So uh, that's another issue that we have to think about. And one of the biggest issues of maintenance of any type of wastewater, and we heard it from our, from our regulator, is the waste uh, product of sludge that is being produced from uh, wastewater. What do you do with the sludge? It's a, main, it's a major cost uh, to most uh, water and wastewater utilities. How do you solve that issue also uh, at a very localized uh, level? Um, I'll talk about that. <clears throat> Um, we use uh, uh, also biological uh, treatment systems, so the large-scale facilities that we have operating in Israel and in most parts of the world uh, use some measure of what we would call activated sludge treatment. Uh, we have modified that in a certain way uh, to use a mixed ecosystem of bacteria and algae, so this is a living biological system. And uh, the advantage of this as well is, is that you do not have to in any way think of inputting any type of chemicals uh, for the uh, treatment process. So it's a chemical-free, biologically uh, living green uh, approach. <clears throat> um, the water uh, that we are producing, the recycled water that comes out of our process, 
uh, is also very much targeted to non-consumptive use. So also we are not interested in providing potable water to communities. We are interested in providing good quality and uh, sus uh, sustainable uh, and reliable quantities of water to farming. I think one of the biggest challenges uh, that we uh, are addressing in the world today, and it's being discussed here in many forums throughout the COP, is that connection between water and food. Food security cannot be in any way developed if you don't have water security. So the connection between water and food, and of course energy as well, is essential. <clears throat> and finally, of course, uh, nobody is going to succeed uh, in solving any of these problems if you don't think about what is the appropriate business model, what is the appropriate financial approach uh, to introducing these technologies so eventually you can make a real difference in the lives of people, uh, specifically in getting them to move from subsistence-based agriculture to income-generating agri agriculture, because that, of course, will have huge uh, uh, socioeconomic impact in terms of standards of living and quality of life, etc. So this is the problem. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with this, right? But uh, Israel, in essence, is an outlier, right? We are super efficient in treating wastewater. We just heard it from our previous speaker. Most of the world is not uh, close to where Israel is. Most developed countries are also facing many of these challenges. So what we see here is around 54% uh, of the world's population had access to safely managed sanitation in, uh, in 2020. But most of the world is actually off the grid. And uh, most sewage, roughly 70% of the sewage generated, is not treated at all. Many uh, places throughout the world are seeing huge problems when sewage is finding its way untreated, or maybe partially treated, flowing into river systems, into the sea. Think about, for example, uh, what happens in places like India, uh, or China, or many countries in Africa, where there are huge problems with the lack of access to sanitation, wastewater treatment, and the impact that has environmentally, and of course, also in terms of public health. Um, for example, now, I don't know if, uh, how many of you know, but in uh, places if, uh, in Syria, because of the refugee crisis precipitated by the ongoing conflict there, there's now a very concerning problem of a cholera outbreak. And that, of course, is directly related to the lack of access to appropriate sanitation measures. So these are the problems that are being faced around the world. And we are thinking that we may have one solution to try to uh, reduce some of these problems and these risks. So you have health hazards, as you see there. Uh, and of course, uh, another problem is the global water scarcity uh, challenge, again, primarily uh, how that water scarcity challenge relates to um, food security. So when we began to think about our approach uh, at Laguna Innovation, uh, one thing that is essential is again to think about what are the potential economic impacts and benefits. It's not just about treat, actually I'll say this, it's not even really about the technology. It's more about how do you make the technology, the intervention sustainable in the long term, and that requires thinking about uh, some kinds of long-term economic uh, uh, advantages. And so we did some calculations. Uh, we have a project now. We're working with uh, partners in, um, in the Palestinian territories in the Northern West Bank. Uh, in the Northern West Bank, one of the most important crops is olive uh, production, mostly olive oil. Olive oil for uh, Middle Eastern and Mediterranean countries is a very high value crop. So if you can improve the irrigation of olive trees, you can improve by almost 50% the quality of olives, and that can get you to improved yield in olive oil of between 20 to 30% from the fruit. So uh, we have done some calculations with a project that we're doing now with Palestinian partners, where we are able to generate something like an additional uh, uh, economic benefit of around $60,000 of olive oil output per year for Palestinian um, olive oil farmers, olive, uh, olive farmers. <coughs> Um, now, of course, we're not the only ones thinking about off-the-grid or decentralized approaches to wastewater management. There are other companies around the world uh, that are looking at these challenges as well. But if you look at many of these uh, companies, one of the problems that they're facing is high energy consumption. I'm sorry, not quite sure why the slides have not uh, calibrated appropriately, but anyway. Uh, high energy consumption is a problem. Uh, these systems have low capacity. 
Um, and there is a, a challenge in how to operate and maintain these systems uh, over, the, over the long term, as I mentioned previously. And a big problem and a big challenge is even small scale or medium scale systems currently on the market, they all still produce sludge in some res respect. And that, of course, adds an additional cost and uh, management burden. Um, and you can see there that quotes approximately 40% of wastewater treatment facilities uh, total annual operating cost is spent on solids management, getting that, so that sludge removed somehow. So this is uh, a summary of our approach, of Laguna Innovation's approach uh, to uh, addressing sanitation and hygiene. Uh, WASH, of course, is the acronym that I think most of you in the room probably are familiar with. And at the end of the day, we're looking at how to promote and increase water and food security for remote and off-grid locations wherever they, may, wherever they may be around the world. Um, and you can see here some of the main elements uh, of our technology. Uh, we make use of solar energy because, again, when you think about off-the-grid from a water or a wastewater perspective, energy is also a problem. Lack of access to the grid is many times uh, the same uh, off-the-grid uh, scenarios that the communities are facing with respect to water. So our systems are completely autonomous. Uh, they do not require any access to the grid. They run off of solar power. And we also have battery backup. So the system basically operates 24-7. <clears throat> A big part of our novel design, and also this is part of our um, uh, patent development, um, is our technology produces close to zero sludge. Now that's a huge advantage because again that means that the cost involved in managing the system drops significantly. If you are not producing sludge or you're producing marginal sludge, of course that has great advantages. Um, the essence of our treatment is what we call the innovative uh, vertical green wall, where again we are using uh, hanging sheets as a surface area to grow a biofilm and it's the interaction of the biofilm with the water that gets us to a high level of effluent that can be reused in in um, agriculture. As I mentioned earlier, of course, modularity and scalability is essential and we can work with our clients dependent on how much wastewater is generated and how much water is required for irrigation in terms of the design of the capacity of the system that is required. Um, remote monitoring, this is actually a really exciting uh, aspect uh, in how the technologies in, water, uh, in the water sector are advancing. There's this real interesting in my opinion, um, growing integration of the hardware and the software. So we are dealing with hardware, but we are integrating software, uh, developing uh, algorithms using AI and all kinds of uh, approaches like that to do remote monitoring and operation. And that's a huge advantage when you're working in remote and hard to access places. You don't need personnel on the ground. That again is a big savings on operation and maintenance. So I can be sitting in my office uh, and I can be getting all the information from my system, wherever it may be, anywhere in the world, in terms of how it's operating, and most importantly, if there are any problems with the facility, with the system, I get a warning or I get a message on my phone, and I can determine, do, can I fix the problem remotely, or do I then have to contact and bring in a person and have that person go out and take care of a maintenance or operational um, issue. Um, this is just a schematic um, of how the technology works. Uh, it's important for me to point out that our system is designed to treat and bring to a high level of effluent quality for irrigation black water. So we are not talking about grey water and we are not talking about separating black from grey. Anything that you put down your toilet, pretty much, once we get rid of m major solids, we can treat and get it to the highest level possible for, for non-consumptive use, irrigation primarily. So we have a pre-treatment phase, and the pre-treatment phase is also where we are able to reduce our sludge to practically zero through a constant remineralization of the organic matter in the sewage. Once the organic matter concentration re uh, re uh, uh, reaches a, a relatively low uh, BOD, biological oxygen demand, we then move the water into our vertical green wall system where the wastewater is trickled or sprayed along a series of hanging sheets and we have that um, effective interaction of the water with the biofilm. Um, and then we get the water to the quality needed uh, to go into irrigation or again, as I said, it could be other non-consumptive uses like landscaping, 
using the water to irrigate things like uh, golf courses or gardening or, or, or really any kind of um, non-consumptive use. Uh, here's some data that uh, show uh, how well some of our pilot projects are working. You can see we have a very large percentage removal uh, of some of the main um, uh, uh, factors that uh, the uh, regulator, we had the regulator earlier, so the Ministry of Health in Israel, these are some of the most important elements that the Ministry of Health will require uh, for you to meet in order to get any kind of um, permitting. Uh, or meeting the compliance needs of the, of the government. So we have high uh, percentage removal of some of the most important factors that have to be measured in order to meet uh, regulations. Um, I wanted to say a few words about some of our case studies. So I mentioned earlier that we're working uh, with our Palestinian partners uh, in the West Bank. Just a, a brief point about that. Throughout the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, around 70% of the population is off the grid. Now this is a problem uh, in many respects because where does that wastewater go? That wastewater basically is discharged into underground cesspits. These cesspits are unlined, so that wastewater, that pollution is eventually percolating into the groundwater, and that groundwater is a source of drinking water for Israelis and Palestinians. So, Tre uh, treating the wastewater is in the interest of both parties, but how do you get the infrastructure in? So because the infrastructure is a problem, we are able to address that problem within the communities on site, uh, and we are doing this quite effectively uh, with our partners in, in the Palestinian territories. Um, but there is also a community in Israel that is not benefiting from the efficiencies uh, that we just heard from the previous speaker, and that is primarily the Bedouin community in the Negev. The Bedouin community make up approximately 20% of the population of the Negev. They have one of the highest population growth rates uh, of any community in Israel. And many of the community is not serviced with infrastructure, neither water, neither wastewater or electricity. So we are also working with the Bedouin community to provide a solution to their wastewater needs, which again is in the interest of everyone, the community, the government, everybody. Um, and we have two, two examples here of small-scale systems. Uh, we are working closely now with the community uh, to address um, the lack of sewage treatment in schools uh, uh, in, the, in the Bedouin community, which of course also has clear concerns for the public health and the safety of the children and the teachers in these communities, um, as well as again everybody around. Um, you can see here in the pictures, maybe you can see that again, the systems are really uh, are very mobile. You put it on the back of a truck, you bring it in to where you need it, uh, you put it on site, and within a couple of hours, uh, the system is up and running uh, and operational. Um, this is just showing you um, uh, a little bit about some of our market research and where we think Laguna Innovation has uh, an edge or advantage over some of our competitors. Um, as I said, uh, the business model is really important uh, when you are working in these uh, scenarios. And uh, we are very flexible in thinking about what will be the best business model or financial model for the client. Of course, you can have direct purchase. Uh, you can, uh, ha if there is a client that can simply pay, not just for the capital costs, but for the long-term operation maintenance, direct purchase, it's easy and simple. Of course, we would be happy to in, uh, interact with clients along those lines, but let's be realistic. In most of the developing world, that's not going to happen. This is why, as a company and also the Arava Institute, we work very closely with the donor community, uh, both within Israel and abroad. Uh, some of our projects in the Palestinian territories, for example, are funded by uh, the USAID and the European Union, uh, but we also work closely with getting grants from the, from the Israeli government, such as the Israeli Ministry of Health, uh, Ministry of Environment, um, and the regional cooperation ministry. Uh, other models that you can look at are a pay-per-use model. Uh, this is very uh, becoming more common in, in many water companies uh, around the world, including Israel. It's like leasing your technology. You don't actually sell it to anybody. You just charge a monthly fee uh, for uh, the uh, long-term operation maintenance, and that fee, of course, has to calculate, has to be calculated, also cover the capital uh, expense of the system. We're also exploring with uh, different companies and technologies, both within Israel and abroad, 
on what we call a bundled model, which is working with other companies that offer, for example, uh, technologies that are also important for agriculture, like irrigation, water quality monitoring, um, and so forth. So we're interested also uh, in partnerships as well. Um, one of the advantages is that the system is plug and play. Once we, are, once we understand how much water needs to be treated and we know what the water quality is, we design the system, it's a package system, you basically get it in a container or in some kind of closed uh, facility. Um, all that we need from the client or from the, from the uh, institution or organization or community that we are serv servicing is the sewage has to get to one point. We normally ask that that happens, that that is done by the client and that they pay for it. And at the moment, we've had no resistance from anybody to doing that. So all the sewage will get to a certain point. It'll collect in an underground reservoir, but it could also be above ground. And then we just simply take our system, we locate it as close to that, that point as possible. We put in a pump and the system is operation, operational with, uh, within a few hours. It takes about a, a month to three months for the biofilm to fully mature. So within that time frame, we get to the level of effluent quality that allows us to safely irrigate uh, uh, crops. Uh, something that I also want to point out very quickly before I finish. Um, for us as a company and for the Arava Institute as an organization, technology is just a vehicle to get us to a point where we are improving people's lives. At the end of the day, if people have water and if people have food and if people have energy and people have housing and jobs and healthcare, obviously their standards of living and their quality of lives improve. So the technology, in a sense, the approach is an enabler to make those things uh, happen. So that's really important for us. And we very much work in partnership with our communities uh, in providing training. So even though I said that operation maintenance is minimum, there's always some training and capacity required. And we will provide that uh, uh, as part of the package of uh, solving uh, or addressing uh, the wash issue uh, within the uh, uh, community that we are working with. Um, this is just a summary. I'm done. This is, I'm done. This is a summary of where we are. We were founded in 2020, as I said, uh, coming out of at least 20 years of research and de development experience from the Arabi Institute. We uh, have today uh, three operational sites, one in uh, the West Bank, one in Israel. Uh, we are starting soon uh, our first project outside the Middle East in South Africa. Um, and next year, uh, we will begin work also in Jordan. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Um, if you want any further information, uh, you can take a look at our website, which uh, it's not the .co, it's, it's lagunareuse.com. Um, and uh, if there are any questions or comments, if we have time available. For one question. For please. one question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Two questions. Two questions. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, who are exactly the target customer? Can you target the uh, home owners? Uh, and the second question, can you give us an idea about the cost? Yes. So, who, who is the client or who are we servicing? Um, really anybody or any entity that is producing sewage and is not able to have that sewage be effectively channeled to a wastewater treatment facility. So, it could be a community, it could be a factory, it could be a hotel, it could be any kind of entity that is at the moment being challenged on how to deal with its wastewater. Um, so currently we're working with farming communities uh, where there is a lack of uh, treatment, but also a very strong need for the effluent. Um, but the, the client, so to speak, can be anybody uh, that at the moment doesn't have an effective solution to the discharge uh, and the treatment of their sewage. In terms of cost, the cost is calculated uh, in terms of cubic meter per, uh, uh, per day. So we at the moment as a company have three levels of systems that we can roll out. A 25 cube a day, a 50 cube a day, and a 100 cube, cube, cube a day. And I can get you more details on the economics. Uh, I will answer in this way. The long term operational cost per cubic meter is 50 US cents. 50 US cents per cubic meter is our operational maintenance cost. Our next okay. do, 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 you, do, do you disinfect at all? Dis, disinfection all depends on what is the use of the effluent. 
So in our project at the moment, we do not disinfect, and that is only because the effluent is being used for uh, um, uh, tree crops. So for example, olives, you irrigate in the roots, you don't really need to think too much about disinfection, but obviously, depending on the use, there are many technologies out there on effective disinfection, and we would be very, we will partner with them uh, depending on what m would be the required level of disinfection as needed. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before you leave the stage, Clive, uh, you ha also have to take into consideration regulation when irrigating with treated wastewater. And we have representative for the Ministry of Health here, and I know that it's not just treating the wastewater and irrigating with it, there are many, many measures that have to be taken into consideration. And if you are going to use the system in your country, then you have to take these measures into account, including the inspection of how the farmers use the treated wastewater. This is very important. Uh, Clive, thank you very much for, for your lecture. Uh, for our last presentation, after hearing from the public, regulation and research sectors, I would like to invite the representative from the private sector. Um, Ronit Sela from Endri Gravity Micro Irrigation, an Israeli ag tech startup company. Ronit Sela serves as a VP project management and impact at Endri. Ronit oversees projects, implementation, and environmental impact across the company's global activities with farmers and other customers. Her talk will present how we can solve the global water shortage by providing the alternative to flight irrigation and offering sustainable and cost-effective solutions to farmers. Ronit, please. It doesn't work. Does this work now? Yes, it does. Good afternoon. Can you hear me well? Yes. All right. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, it is the first time that Endrip is giving a talk here in Egypt. But we actually mention Egypt in a lot of our talks. And you'll understand that connection in a moment. So I want to present with you how Endrip is working. Uh, and I also want you to take from this talk not only things about Endrip, but also about flood irrigation, which is the focus of my talk and is an issue that needs to be taken into consideration when we're talking about the context of climate. So, Endrip is an Israeli company, and we are on a mission to help solve the global water shortage problem. And how do we want to solve it? By providing the ultimate alternative to flood irrigation. So, making a shift from inefficient flood irrigation to precise irrigation is how we can achieve that goal. Endrip was founded by Professor Uri Shani, a renowned Israeli water expert. Uri Shani was the former director of Israel's Water Authority. We heard a presentation today about the Water Authority. Um, he is a man who had the courage in that capacity to revolutionize water management in Israel and help Israel become a leader in water savings and in water management and in water innovation. Different countries, countries come to Israel today to learn from Israel. And while Israel is saving so much water, Professor Shani looked around the world and he saw in dismay how precious water is being wasted all around the world because of flood irrigation. And he set out to invent a solution that will be the alternative to flood irrigation, a sustainable alternative to flood irrigation. And it is from that mission that our technology and that our company grew. And today the Endrip irrigation solution, which is a precise and gravity powered irrigation solution, is that, that alternative. And it addresses the nexus that you see on the slide. We save huge amounts of water. We also save on energy and we secure food security. So I've been hearing here at COP27 a lot of talk about multi-solution. So a solution that does not address a single problem, but actually can provide the answer to several, to several different problems. And this is what Endrip is trying to do. 
Now let's look at these figures. And again, this is about Android, but this is also about flood irrigation. So today, fresh water is av the availability of fresh water is down by 50% per capita. And we know that agriculture uses 70% of all water withdrawals. Now the third figure is what I want you to take from this conversation. 85% of all irrigated farmland around the world is flood irrigated. So if we want to solve the water problem in irrigation, this is where we go to. If we can decrease that number, 85%, we can save huge amounts of water. Now, sustainable irrigation is key to sustainable farming. And sustainable farming, sustainable agriculture is part of what we're doing here in Sharem. I've been to a lot of talks where the connection of food and agriculture and climate have been discussed. So if you want to get to sustainable agriculture in order to move forward with our climate mitigation goals, with our climate adaptation goals, we have to take into consideration also sustainable irrigation. We talk in climate about business as usual, and I want to take a moment to talk about business as usual for flood irrigation. What does it look like? What is the trajectory if we continue business as usual and we continue flooding? So flood irrigation is a contributing factor to the drying out of rivers and water, and water wells. It is also a contributor to groundwater pollution and to soil erosion. So without enough water, and without healthy soils and with a growing population, we really cannot face the challenge of providing water security. And flood irrigation is also a contributing factor to greenhouse gas emissions. Because with flood, we use much more water, which is often provided by using more energy and electricity. We also excessively use fertilizers. Because if you flood a field, you cannot provide precise fertilizers. So farmers need to put a lot of fertilizers, fertilizers that then are wasted because they never reach the actual plants. So that's CO2, that's N2O. And in the case of rice, like in this picture, the rice paddy, that's a huge source of methane. So all the things we want to stop are part of that story. Now, flood irrigation is used because that's what we know how to do irrigation. This is how we know how to irrigate. And, we t and I say that we talk about Egypt because it is here with the Nile River that we were given this amazing gift to be able to flood irrigate. And we've been doing it for thousands of years. But we also know that times have changed. And we know that we are demanded to change. And that we cannot just rely on our rivers. We actually need to protect our rivers in the world that we're living in today. So understanding the scale of the problem is important because if we want to have a solution that addresses and solves the big problem, it needs to come at a big scale. So out of 700 million acres of farmland that is irrigated worldwide, 600 of 700 is flood irrigated. It is here in Egypt and across Africa, but it really doesn't stop there. Actually, in every single continent around the world, flood irrigation is common practice. So even in places where there are farmers that use advanced methods, that use automation, high-level technology, flood irrigation is still commonplace. The interesting thing is that we actually know that there is precise irrigation solutions, and that these solutions have been around now for more than half a century. So there is precise irrigation, and it does amazing work by saving at least half the amount of water or more. And it has a lot of other benefits. But we also, for scale, we also need to go to the market. Excuse me. And look at the market share of precise irrigation. So putting together sprinklers with standardized drip irrigation is still a very small market share, even after more than half a century. And the reason is that the market wants affordable solutions that farmers can pay for, that are easy to operate, and that solve multiple issues. And while these do solve the water waste, they don't address all of the issues, and a, new, and a different solution is needed for that. So now, 
to NDRIP. We're here to transfer, to transfer flooded fields to NDRIP fields. And if you weren't sure up until this point in my talk what a flooded field looks like, this is what it looks like. And it's so easy to see how much water is wasted, how much water is in the field, but never reaches the tree. The tree only takes some of the water. Everything else is wasted. This lemon orchard is in Yuma, Arizona. It is one of the hottest places in the United States. It is a place that is suffering from extreme drought today. And that scientists are telling us that the Colorado River, which is the source of the canals that are irrigating these fields, the Colorado River is at its worst condition in more than 1,000 years. So Arizona is a place that needs today to move to efficient and precise irrigation. The other field you see is an endrop irrigated field just right nearby, an orchard. Let me try to explain the picture. You see the canal, that's the canal from the Colorado River. The water by gravity go into a water tank and from there it goes to, through drip lines. And the drip lines go until the end of the field. So water gets to the very last lemon tree and all the lemon trees get sufficient irrigation. But water is not wasted. And this, this is what precise gravity powered irrigation looks like. And this is why we're doing all the work that we do so that we can change that picture from flood to that picture. Our magic, if I can call it that, is in a dripper. A dripper is here in the picture surrounded by a circle. It's a tiny, tiny piece of plastic. But drip all the drip irrigation systems have a plastic that helps them regulate the water that comes out of the drip, of the drip line. So the NDRIP dripper is proprietary. It's a patent. And the way it is designed internally is what helps us be able to irrigate a lemon field or any other field efficiently. In addition to the NDRIP irrigation solution, which I'll talk more about, we also have NDRIP Connect. And Endrip Connect is a decision support system. Farmers who use Endrip Connect have an app on their phone. And at any point in the day, they can access data that is specific to their field, specific to their crop, specific to how, to how they are doing, and get from it the data that they need to be able to optimize their yields, to save water, to use less fertilizers, and in that process, also to save money. And the NDRIP Connect is also used by our expert teams who support farmers all across the world. Through the system, they can monitor remotely and they can give advice and they support and work with big farmers who are moving to NDRIP and with smallholder farmers that are doing NDRIP. And you just saw the lemon, the lemon orchard, but we wanted to have a solution that would work on multiple crops. So we today have projects with farmers who are growing cotton, and alfalfa, and sugar cane, barley, sorghum, potatoes, maize. We want to be that solution that can work with all the different types of crops. So before I showed you a picture comparing flood irrigation to NDRIP, and now this is a picture comparing high pressure drip to NDRIP. So on the left side, you see a big machine, red and black. It's really big and heavy, and it blocks the view. And it's a system of high pressure drip. So there are pumps and there are filters because to operate pressurized drip, which is everybody apart from NDRIP in our sector, you have to have a filter that filters the water and you have to use pumps. So when a farmer wants to use this system, that system, he has to buy this and put it in the field and then also use electricity throughout the season to operate it. And right next to it, much smaller, is the Endrip water tank that you saw in the previous slide. That is it. It is that simple. There's a canal, next to it there's a water tank, and through gravity water comes from the canal to the water tank, and from the water tank to the field. And that is it. No pumps, no filter, no water tower, and no electricity. And this is why it's also a much more affordable solution for the farmers using it. And it's also a much more portable solution that can be easily moved from one place to another. 
the water level in the tank, if you're from, from this context, you might be wondering, is 50 centimeters only. 50 centimeters is enough to provide the irrigation needed. So if you compare NDRIP to pressurized systems, we use 5% in comparison. We just don't need a lot of water pressure to irrigate and to use our system. The field next to it is a soya bean field. And these are the results from the first season. This field was flood irrigated and then and now is being endrop irrigated. And in the first season, the, the results was 50% um, savings in water, which is fantastic, but also expected in precise irrigation. Yield increase for this field in so the soybean field was 24%, which is substantial and also needed in a world where we need to be more efficient in how we grow food. We need more food. And we also did a comparison in this field of greenhouse gas emissions, again, comparing flood to end drip. And it was a staggering 71% difference. So 71% savings of greenhouse gases. If we're, if we're looking at the rice field from the other picture, we can save even more water for rice and we can do even more greenhouse gas um, emission reduction. And that's for methane. So that's super important. So this is just in the first, in the first uh, year of this project. Um, we're already working, as I said, we're an Israeli company. Our headquarters are in Israel. Uh, we, are, we already are working around the world. Um, but this is only the beginning, because again, our mission really is to work worldwide and to worldwide make that shift from flood irrigation to precise and sustainable irrigation. Um, we, work, we obviously are looking to work in, in countries and with communities that are suffering from water stress. But what's interesting about doing NDRIP in this day and age, in 2022, is that many places around the world that are not water stressed are still looking for more sustainable ways to do their, to do their agricultural practices. So there are multiple incentives to change from flood irrigation to NDRIP. We are working directly with farmers in providing them a system that is affordable and that is simple and that they can, pro they can pretty easily use and learn how to use. So, early, so the, the adapters, the first adapters. We are working with companies that have set ambitious sustainability goals and are looking to partner with NDRIP so that they can reach their ambitious goals. And we're working also with officials, with administrations, with, in places around the world where government understands that they have to work today because the problems are pressing and they're going to be more pressing tomorrow. And they're looking for solutions, solutions to allow their farmers to continue farming, but not exhaust water in all those areas. So we're, looking with, we're working with them too. As I said, we're a multi-solution um, irrigation. So we address different needs in different contexts. And our fields and our products are, are tailored to the specific needs in the context. And I'm proud to say that NDRIP today is succeeding where others have tried but failed to convert inefficient flood to precise irrigation. And we're able to do that because we are truly offering today the ultimate sustainable alternative to flood irrigation. Um, I want to thank you. I want to invite you to come talk to me. And as we say, come and drip with us. Thank you. Any quest questions? Please. What's the effect of this system on agricultural runoff into local streams? Specifically, I'm thinking of like nitrogen levels and things like that. So we see a, we see a very big reduction in fertilizers. But there's actually a spectrum. So some of the crops wouldn't, in, for some of the crops, it would be only fertilizers that are placed before the, even the crop is planted. So really at the beginning of the field. And for other crops, it's throughout the season. But, but the reduction of, of fertilizers is immense. And because that's the whole, the whole thing of precise irrigation is that we can get the nutrients to the root zone just below the dripper. And there's a, there's a lot of reduction. And as I said, for farmers, they need the system to be affordable. And with the price of fertilizers, if they can reduce fertilizers using this, this has like amazing uh, benefits financially. Any other questions? I have a question. 
You said that the level of the water in the tank is 50 centimeters, half a meter actually, but the tank itself? The tank itself is not elevated. It, just, it needs to be below the canal and so that, that with gravity. That's enough. And that's enough. So we're actually a low pressure. How big is the field? So fields can be up to 600, 700 meters, but th that would just mean that if somebody's field is, is, big, is uh, longer, we just have another water tank to fill that need. So we, ta we actually tailor, we, we, we tailor design each of the fields to optimize water and what the crop needs. 50 centimeters is, is amazing, well done. Any other questions besides mine? Oni, thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs> I would like to invite uh, Danny to give some uh, closing remarks. Okay. Okay, let's wrap it up and see what we had. Uh, we talked about regulation. Yes, I'm a regulator. Uh, um, how we design our system, how do we create motivation for, for change, how do we encourage the system to work as we want it to. We had research. How do we use the research to have a better world? How can we have crops more resilient to drought? How can we have crops that will start with using less water? And then we had uh, um, two technologies. We had the technology which is for small communities, very specific small communities off what I would call off the grid. And then we had NDROP, which are changing the world. Um, I must say, I learned with Professor Uri Shani uh, irrigation about 27 years ago. I'm sure he gave a course that what he's doing here is impossible. Impossible with a half a meter of, of water to do the change, but well, okay. You are really changing the world. Um, I think these are examples of the Israeli system, how we work, how we run the system. We dealt with our problems, uh, not necessarily your problems, wherever you come from in the world, but you can learn from our experience, you can learn from our mistakes, you can learn from our opportunities, and I wish you all a lot of luck. On behalf of the Ministry of Agriculture of the State of Israel, I would like to thank you for visiting the Israeli Pavilion and participating in our events. It's also very important to remember that water is a global issue and it's our uh, collective responsibility to take care of it. Thank you and enjoy your stay here at COP27.